My name is Dan Happel. I'm uh, a county commissioner from Madison County uh, in southwest Montana. However, I've got a standard disclaimer that I use. Uh, I am not here representing Madison County, uh, or am I here representing the county commissioners for my county. I am here as a concerned citizen representing the other freedom-loving Americans that are concerned about uh, a process that we have in this country and a, uh, a program called Agenda 21 that is being implemented uh, all over our country. Uh, I also, I, I give a better than money back guarantee on my, uh, on my programs. Uh, my, my better than money back guarantee is that the first person that can prove uh, anything uh, substantially incorrect with, uh, with the base, basic thesis of this program, uh, I will give $1,000 cash. And uh, so I, I hope that people will actually try to check my program out, do uh, your own search, and you'll find that it is accurate. And uh, I've been giving the same guarantee for over six years, and I've never had anyone collect a dime. So um, hopefully that'll continue because, well, uh, let's put it this way. If you do collect on it, that means I'm, I'm wrong, and I can go home, and I can get a lot of rest, and I can quit doing this stuff. So anyway, uh, this is uh, uh, the Big Footprint Conference. Three years ago this summer, in, uh, in June, I uh, was asked to be a speaker at a uh, program called the Big Footprint Conference. This was a program at UCLA at the uh, Faculty Center. There's some of the uh, uh, top scientists and experts in the country uh, were uh, speakers at this program. And uh, let me, yeah, okay, try it again. All right, um, and a lot of them were faculty in various universities, scientists from all over the world, PhDs, um, uh, quite a number of really, really good experts. And uh, this is me here, but I, I was uh, asked to be a member of this, uh, this discussion and this panel because I was one of two county commissioners in the United States that were actively uh, fighting against Agenda 21. And this uh, gentleman here, uh, R Richard Rothschild, he was uh, Carroll County, Maryland, the first county in the United States to throw Ickley out. And uh, so we had a great bunch of experts here. We had an uh, amazing bunch of people. This uh, Peter Wood is the, uh, uh, the, the president of the uh, National Scholars Association. We had PhDs all over, and frankly, I was completely outgunned. This is a philosophy of rights, and this is a, a comparison of individual rights under the U.S. Declaration of Independence and the community rights under the U.N. Declaration of Human Rights. There's quite a difference. We need to look at those. Uh, the purpose of government under the uh, U.S. Declaration of Independence, the purpose is to protect the natural or unalienable, and that is the correct pronunciation, unalienable, uh, rights of each individual that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And in short, you're born with rights. Uh, government exists just to protect those rights, and you and the product of your labor belong to you and not to the government. Under the community rights of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, control of the individual for the greater good of a global community rights and freedoms in no way may be exercised contrary to the purposes and the principles of the United Nations. And under this system, government grants, restricts, or withdraws your rights according to its needs, not yours. And you and the product of your labor belong to the community, and that's communism. This is a famous quote by uh, George Washington, government is not reason, it's not eloquent, it is force, and like, it, uh, like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. And uh, Daniel Webster said in uh, 1854, good intentions will always be pleaded for every assumption of power. It is hardly too strong to say that the Constitution was made to guard the people against the dangers of good intentions. There are man, men in all ages who mean to govern well, but they do mean to govern. 
They promise to be good masters, but they mean to be your masters. And this is a uh, cartoon from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Uh, this gentleman here is Karl Marx. Uh, behind him is uh, J.P. Morgan, Teddy Roosevelt, our first progressive socialist president. Uh, this gentleman here is uh, Perkins and uh, uh, J.D. Rockefeller and Ryan. Behind him, the president of the Rockefeller Banks. And uh, this is uh, uh, Andrew Carnegie. And uh, I, know, I don't think most people are aware of this, but uh, U.S. and European bankers were the primary source of funds for the Bolshevik Revolution and made it possible for Lenin and Trotsky to over, overthrow Tsar Nicholas and the reform government that had been put in place. Uh, that reform government had been in power for six months, and uh, it was actually a constitutional republican form of government very similar to our own. Uh, it's no accident that uh, communism uh, ended up taking over in Russia. Okay, this is uh, Fabian, uh, Fabian Society. This is the uh, famous uh, Fabian window in, at the Fabian Society in London. Um, and you'll see this uh, in the leaded glass and the stained glass. We mold it near the heart's desire. Uh, this is uh, uh, a uh, crest here that talks about uh, devotion. And uh, this talks about the uh, uh, prayer and devotion to socialism. Uh, these folks here are praying to a stack of books on socialism. And the uh, crest of the Fabian Society is this right here. Uh, it is a wolf in sheep's clothing. And uh, this is Sydney, Sydney Webb. Uh, and uh, uh, they are... Uh, pounding or forming the uh, molten earth into the shape that they want. This is the uh, Fabian socialism that's been driving much of European and American socialism for the last 100, 120 years. <clears throat> this is the uh, uh, Communist Manifesto. I'm sure we all recognize many of these. This is a, uh, a chart that shows how many of these uh, programs are actually being implemented by various uh, agencies of our own federal government. Uh, abolition of private property, uh, heavy progressive income tax, abolition of rights of inheritance, uh, confiscation of property of all immigrants and rebels, uh, a central bank system, government control of communications and transportation, uh, government ownership of factories and agriculture, uh, government control of labor, uh, corporate farms and regional planning, and government control of education. How many of those uh, have, have we not been affected by? Uh, virtually uh, everything in that uh, Communist Manifesto is at least in part in, uh, in, in our programs in our government right now. This is uh, Stalin's 1936 Communist International. Uh, this was the official program declaration of that conference. Uh, this world dictatorship can be established only when the victory of socialism has been achieved and newly established proletarian republics enter into a federative union with the already existing proletarian republics. And when these federations of republics have finally grown into a world union of Soviet socialist republics, uniting the whole of mankind under the hegemony of the international proletariat organized as a state. Uh, this sounds an awful lot like the UN, uh, and I think most people recognize that. And this is a uh, quote from Stalin, America's like a healthy body. Its resistance is threefold. Its patriotism, its morality, and its spiritual life. If we can undermine these three areas, America will collapse from within. And I believe that's in the process of happening today. And this is a Google search, if you wish, uh, the 1936 Soviet Constitution. And uh, the... Uh, uh, Declaration of Human Rights under the UN is virtually identical to the Declaration of Human Rights under the Soviet Constitution in 1936. And there's a reason for that. Uh, Alger Hiss. Alger Hiss was the uh, lead American author. Uh, 
And matter of fact, uh, 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 Joel Skousen referred to Alger Hiss last night in his speech. And uh, uh, Alger Hiss was the American author and executive secretary of the Dumbarton Oaks Conference that drafted the framework for the United Nations. Uh, Hiss was accused and later convicted of perjury for his part uh, in Soviet espionage activities while serving in the State Department. Uh, he was the first Secretary General of the United Nations. And he was uh, actually, he was uh, Secretary for about a year, and then he was, uh, he was asked to resign in disgrace when all this information came out. <clears throat> and this is uh, um, some of the folks in this room that are my age re remember uh, Nikita Khrushchev. Um, your children's children will live under communism. You Americans are so gullible. No, you won't accept communism outright, but we'll keep feeding you small doses, doses of socialism until you will finally wake up and find that you already have communism. We won't have to fight you. We'll so weaken your economy until you fall like overripe fruit into our hands. This was in 1959. This was actually uh, part of his speech at the UN uh, when he pounded his shoe on the podium. And then, <clears throat> Yuri Andropov, and well, I'll try make some connections here. Uh, Yuri Andropov was the uh, premier of the Soviet Union uh, in the 80s, uh, and uh, he had a, a policy that was a strategic move uh, to get communism in the Western Western uh, countries. He recognized that he couldn't beat us militarily uh, because our, our uh, uh, political system and our economic system was too strong and it would bury the Soviet system. So he, uh, he decided to start implementing uh, communism through gradualism and it had been going on for quite some time. But that, that push really started happening under the Andropov plan. And uh, I, if folks want to uh, do a little of their own research, uh, look into Antonio Gramsci and uh, the prison notebooks. Uh, uh, Gramsci actually uh, wrote much of what uh, Andropov used in this uh, uh, strategy. And this is uh, several books that are worth looking at. Uh, this is Anatoly Galitsyn, uh, Perestroika Deception. And this is uh, disinformation. This was written by a general. Actually, he was a, uh, a lieutenant general in the uh, uh, Bulgarian, I believe, uh, or Romanian uh, military. And he basically, both of these gentlemen said, this whole idea of the fall of communism is a scam. Uh, you folks had better wake up because uh, this is just uh, deception. And uh, this is, uh, I'm going to use some quotes here. This is uh, James Paul War Warburg, who was the uh, son of Paul Warburg, uh, one of the uh, authors of the Federal Reserve Act. He uh, met on, on uh, Jekyll Island, uh, where they dreamed up the uh, policy of the Federal Reserve. And this is a quote in uh, 1950 before the U.S. Senate. We shall have world government whether or not we like it. The only question is whether world government will be achieved by conquest or by consent. And uh, on, underneath that, uh, uh, Rowan Gaither, the president of the Ford Foundation, uh, is quoted as saying, and this is 1954, we operate here under directives that emanate from the White House. The substance of the directives under which we operate is that we shall use our grant-making power to alter life in the United States so that we can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. And so welcome to the New World Order. And uh, this book right here, Limits of Growth, this is a book that came out of the uh, 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 Rome, uh, Club of Rome. Uh, and this was a book that uh, talked about how uh, our reduction in consumption and our re reduced roles in, uh, in utilizing our natural resources and control of the people could happen. And they uh, determined after a, uh, quite a bit of study that uh, environmentalism would be a good avenue to pursue because it would provide uh, a, a very hard, very difficult to track uh, uh, 
policy that they were going to be able to follow and be able to take over our system of government. Uh, Agenda 21, I know a lot of, uh, if you talk to our, legis our uh, congressmen and our senators, they'll tell you they don't know a thing about it, they never heard of it. Uh, this is Paul Simon wrote the introduction to this book on Agenda 21. They know completely uh, everything there is to know about Agenda 21, and they know exactly what it is. And they're uh, involved in the implementation, at least a, a significant number of them. This is Agenda 21. Uh, it is the name of the white paper that was produced after the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. Uh, it outlines a socialist plan for a sustainable world. I mean, we hear that word uh, a million times a day anymore. A sustainable world in the 21st century. Uh, this is the book right here. It's uh, uh, 700 and some pages, and uh, it covers everything they plan to do. Uh, the Rio Summit was billed as a world conference on the catastrophic global environmental issues facing mankind and a blueprint for a sustainable 21st century. Uh, in reality, uh, the Rio Summit was a blueprint for the future of mankind where our constitution, national sovereignty, and unalienable rights are eliminated and replaced by a world government controlled by a powerful cartel of international financial elites. Agenda 21 is a blueprint for the 21st century, and uh, the summit was organized and chaired by uh, UN Under Secretary Marie Strong. He's the Secretary General of UNCED. Mr. Uh, uh, Strong is a Canadian billionaire and acknowledged Marxist, and, uh, and now he is living in communist China and ask, acting as an advisor to the Chinese government on economic policy and international trade agreements. And this is a quote by Mr. Strong. It's clear that current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class involving high meat intake and consumption of large amounts of frozen and convenience foods, use of fossil fuels, ownership of motor vehicles and small electrical appliances, home and workplace air conditioning and suburban housing are not sustainable. And this is uh, Mr. Strong right here. And this is his very good friend, Mikhail Gorbachev. This was at the Rio F Plus Five uh, conference in March of 97. And uh, Mr. Gorbachev, a lot of people don't know what happened to Mr. Gorbachev. Well, uh, when he was deposed as the Soviet leader, uh, and he was the premier of the Soviet Union, uh, he was given millions of dollars by the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations uh, to fund the Gorbachev Foundation. And the Gorbachev Foundation is a parent of Green Cross, which is the most respected and revered environmental organization in the world. Uh, and this is uh, uh, Kevin Spacey and Sharon Stone at a gala event that they had to celebrate, I believe it was his 84th birthday, uh, at the Royal Palladium in London. And uh, most people uh, don't realize, but uh, Gorby has never renounced his ties to international communism. In fact, they're stronger than ever. This is a, uh, a quote in, in uh, November of 1987. Uh, in October 1917, we parted with the old world, rejecting it once and for all. We are moving into a new world, a world of communism. We shall never turn off that road. Comrades, do not be concerned about all that you hear about glasnost and perestroika and democracy in the coming years. These are primarily for outward consumption. There will be no significant internal change within the Soviet Union other than for cosmetic purposes. Our purpose is to disarm the Americans and let them fall asleep. Now this was just a couple of years. This was four years before uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, so-called fall of the Soviet Union. And this is, uh, uh, right now, this is uh, Vladimir Putin, the new uh, premier, or president he is now, of the Soviet Union, and they, they call it Russia. But he's restructuring, he's putting the whole thing back together. I mean, that's what uh, this thing that's going on in the Ukraine, in all of the uh, stands of uh, 
the Middle East in, uh, in uh, what used to be part of the Russian republics, uh, they are going to be restructured. We are moving into a world communist system. And uh, this is a quote from David Rockefeller. Um, we've got to bring the money into this equation. Uh, some even believe that we're part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. Uh, this is a quote by David Rockefeller in his memoirs in 2002. And uh, in interestingly, Marxism, we know what Marxism, communism, uh, Marx called it scientific socialism. Uh, communism can best be defined as the elimination of private property. That's a quote from V.I. Lennon. And uh, Prince Philip, uh, our, one of our uh, 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 British sovereigns who happens to be one of our allies, uh, who happened to found the uh, World Wildlife Fund, incidentally, uh, one of his quotes, we reject the idea of private property. And you'll love this picture. Here's Prince Philip right here. This is Castro. Uh, they're, they're good, good friends. Um, and this quote, uh, in, in marked contrast to the near universal jeers and boos that greeted every U.S. representative at Rio, the Earth Summit, uh, the Agenda 21 Earth Summit, uh, throngs went wild for Castro, who was greeted with prolonged tumultuous applause and calls of Viva Fidel. And uh, this is incidentally George Soros over here, and a quote by him, the main obstacle to a stable and just world order is the United States. Now, anybody that knows anything about George Soros knows that he's pumping billions of dollars into various uh, left-wing programs in this country uh, that are supporting all kinds of environmental and all kinds of uh, other uh, left-wing agendas. Um, he, do, he does not believe in the United States. He would like to see the United States destroyed. This is um, a book that uh, came several years after the uh, Rio summit. It's uh, Our Global Neighborhood. Uh, Nelson Mandela was uh, a participating writer and wrote a, uh, uh, a uh, general overview of that report. And uh, Nelson Mandela here, who happens to be the darling of the left, and uh, a lot of us think he's a really great guy. Uh, this is a picture of him with Joe Slovo, who is the head of the uh, ANC, the uh, African National Conference, which is a communist group. And they're standing in front of the uh, hammer sickle. And you'll see the clenched fist. This is a sign of international communism. Um, and you will see that uh, at many of the uh, SEIU and the Occupy Wall Street events. And we'll see that shortly. But uh, Mr. Mandela is a darling of the UN. And uh, uh, they made a day to... Uh, uh, inspire people to give 67 minutes of, of one day a year to uh, public service just for um, uh, in memory of Nelson Mandela. And uh, Nelson Mandela is, uh, was the uh, uh, president of uh, South Africa. And while he was president, this, uh, these folks here were uh, Boer farmers uh, in uh, Dutch Boer beans farmer. And uh, they were uh, killed, and that's happening on a regular basis throughout Africa. Um, a lot of the uh, colonial farmers that have been there for well over 100 years uh, are being killed, and their farms are being taken away and turned into collectives for the friends of the powerful leaders in South Africa. And uh, this gentleman right here uh, happens to be uh, the new ANC chief and president, uh, Jacob Zuma. And uh, Mr. Zuma is a uh, self-described communist, and uh, he sings songs at uh, various events like Kill the Boar, uh, inciting genocide against whites. This is the, the um, we, you, all we heard about was apartheid in South Africa. 
uh, we've got a new racism going on that uh, is much worse in South Africa than the apartheid or every bit as bad. This is a Occupy Wall Street group. Um, you see this clenched fist. Again, that's a sign of international communism. And uh, they've been treated, Occupy Wall Street has been treated as a populist, inclusive, pro-American uh, demonstration of the uh, uh, majority of Americans and has given favorable reviews while the uh, Tea Party has been labeled as a bunch of right-wing uh, radicals and extremists. And uh, that just is not so. And this is one of the uh, uh, groups that show up at all of the major Occupy Wall Street rallies. This is a group called Anonymous. They are international anarchists. And this is a, uh, a picture of a, uh, a group of young college students that are uh, protesting. Uh, and this uh, sign is pretty, uh, you see this at a lot of these rallies. The whole system has got to go. Capitalism is organized crime. This is the stuff that our kids are being taught at the university level. And they're uh, out on the street promoting it. And this is uh, another Occupy Wall Street, this young man here, uh, Eat the Rich. And this, uh, you know, I'd say gentleman, uh, with the sign behind him, that's solidarity, that's international communism. These signs and these uh, people show up at all these events, all the major ones, certainly. And this is uh, Arab Spring, and this is a uh, hammer and sickle, and we recognize that. Uh, Arab Spring that our uh, president was so proud to uh, promote uh, because it was a, a truly great independence movement. Now we see what's going on in the Middle East, and it's pretty sad. This is uh, another quote by David Rockefeller. Uh, one is impressed immediately by the sense of national harmony. Whatever the price of Chinese revolution, it has obviously succeeded in fostering high morale and community purpose. General social and economic progress is no less impressive. The enormous social advances of China have benefited greatly from the singleness of ideology and purpose. The social experiment in China under Chairman Mao's leadership is one of the most important and successful in history. Now this was after the Great Leap Forward, this was after the Cultural Revolution, this was after some uh, estimates as high as uh, 50 some million Chinese were killed under, under Chairman Mao's leadership. Uh, anyway, uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush signed the Rio Accords in the, at the 92 Earth Summit on behalf of the United States. Within months, cabinet level agencies and UN-sponsored NGOs started embedding policies of sustainable development into bureaucratic regulations and lobbying efforts. Uh, shortly after his inauguration in 93, President Bill Clinton created the President's Council on Sustainable Development by executive order. By making sustainable development a permanent feature of all federal policy within the administrative branch, he effectively bypass Congress and through Agenda 21 implementation into high gear, forever changing the mission of federal agencies from serving the people to serving the environment. I think we all remember the days when Forest Service trucks, the old green trucks with radio deletes, and, and they were uh, people that worked so hard for the, uh, for the public interest and the public trust, and now they're serving the environment. And it really has radically changed if you've had contact with a lot of these agencies. The Sustainability Treaty failed passage in the U.S. Senate in 94 is required under our Constitution by a vote of 98 to 2 because of uh, the last minute heroics on the Senate floor by Dr. Michael Kaufman and Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison. And this is a map that was presented on the floor of the Senate uh, all the red areas are core reserves and corridors with virtually no human use. The uh, buffer zones, these yellow areas, 
are very highly regulated use with uh, very limited human activity. And the normal use basically is this right here. You'll see kind of throughout the Midwest and up on the high line. And this is a uh, map of the uh, percentages of federal land that are owned uh, in the United States by the federal government. You hear about this uh, movement to try to transfer public lands. Well, uh, the federal government's going to fight this tooth and nail because this is the, uh, a very key element of their collection of public lands that will end up becoming part of this global commons. In uh, uh, the western states, uh, Montana has 30% uh, federal land. Uh, Nevada and some of the states have uh, over 80 percent. Um, we're going to see a real fight over this. They're not going to give up that land easily. And this is Montana and this kind of shows you uh, this is the red areas that are no basically no human use. Here you are right here in uh, Kalispell and uh, you'll see that these areas are uh, are uh, very, very small areas that uh, human use is even going to be considered, and they will be very tightly monitored. And this is from the uh, UN Habitat uh, Conference, uh, Habitat One in Vancouver in 1976. Uh, this was agenda item number 10, and this is a quote from that. Uh, land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market. Private land ownership is also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth and therefore contributes to social injustice. If unchecked, it may become a major obstacle in the planning and implementation of development schemes. These aren't our development schemes, these are uh, the UN's development schemes and if you look at this language it is clearly communist uh, language. Sustainability of the environment and creating a more equitable world are buzzwords for destruction of the middle class through income redistribution, applying impossibly restrictive regulations that destroy private property rights and the deliberate deindustrialization of America and Western Europe through international trade organizations such as NAFTA, GATT, WTO, North American Union, and the European Union. And, and we constantly hear people talking with, this morning at the uh, MAKO conference, we had a gentleman go up talking about the WTO and some of these trade agreements and how we needed to comply and work with them. Um, this is the mentality. Under Agenda 21, many of man's activities are listed as unsustainable and targeted for elimination by 2030. Uh, all private property ownership and rights will be eliminated. All forms of crop irrigation, pesticides, and commercial fertilizers, except when approved for big agribusiness, uh, such as Monsanto, ADM, etc. Uh, livestock production and most meat consumption will end. We will be living in a vegetarian world. Uh, privately owned vehicles and personal travel will be a thing of the past. Burning of fossil fuels for energy production or personal vehicular travel will be a thing of the past. Uh, single family homes and suburban housing will be a thing of the past. Uh, most forms of mineral extraction and timber harvesting will be ended. Dams, golf courses, ski lodges and vacation resorts will be uh, phased out and eventually eliminated. Uh, and then this is the scary part of it and this is in their writing, you can find it in their writings, in various writings. Uh, human population needs to be reduced. We are not living in a sustainable uh, population right now and it needs to be reduced. They said originally to under a billion people. I've read recently that they say it could be uh, as much as two and a half billion people uh, if we follow all of the dictates and all of the uh, programs of Agenda 21. Uh, that's still reducing a population from seven billion to two and a half billion. That's huge. So uh, to implement the ideas of sustainable development, an overlapping of three primary objectives must occur. Uh, we'll refer to them as the three E's of equity, 
economy, and the environment. Let's see what they look like uh, under the framework of Agenda 21. And this is the uh, sweet spot right here. Uh, these are good spots. This is the sweet spot. Equity. <clears throat> it means using the law and government to restructure and modify human nature. It allows special interest to use the police powers of the state to force compliance with the laws that, with laws that are antithetical to constitutional law. It allows educators and social engineers to stifle individualism, personal responsibility, and self-reliance, and promotes a complete shift in attitudes through public education and social justice indoctrination to a more just and equitable world where communalism is good and self-interest in capitalism is redefined as greed. Communalism is the new word for communism. This mindset substitutes social justice, redistribution policies for equal justice, which are equal rights under the law, and destroys the concept of unalienable rights under the law. The youth will be taught that they're global citizens rather than Americans, and educators will be unwittingly teaching the views and dictates of socialist global planners through programs like Goals 2000, No Child Left Behind, the new one is Common Core. Uh, those programs are modeled from UNESCO's global program, Education for All. These are UN uh, programs that uh, inspire many of these US uh, education programs today. And the uh, term equitable is used to describe the transfer of wealth from developed nations to underdeveloped nations by moving manufacturing and infrastructure to third world countries through a carbon credit system under the blanket of cleaning up the environment. This is a uh, chemical plant in China. Uh, if it was about cleaning up the environment, I don't think we'd be sending our clean chemical industries and our EPA regulated industries to China. It's not about the environment. Economy, uh, transfer of wealth from developed countries to underdeveloped countries or developing countries. Uh, the authors of Agenda 21 use a Marxist socialist worldview that treats life as a zero sum game where the creation of wealth can only come at the expense of others less fortunate. Living in third world or exploited countries, uh, the monetary systems of, so of sovereign nations must be collapsed and merged uh, into a world financial system controlled by a cartel of international banking elites and their cadre of central bank planners under this system. Under a one world financial system, all human activity can be closely monitored and tightly controlled. Digital financial transactions will rapidly evolve into a cashless society where an electronic device implanted in a card or under the skin will be scanned and electronically entered into a database that will record all of your transactions. Anyone that fails to comply with the regulations or exhibits an attitude of resistance may have their transactions denied and will either comply or they will starve. That simple. And this is a quote by our friend David Rockefeller, who is, happens to be, uh, I think there's no question he's the richest man uh, in our country, if not the world. Uh, we are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and the other great publications whose re directors have attended our meetings and respected their promise of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subject to the bright lights of publicity during those years. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march toward a world government. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national auto-determination practiced in past centuries. This was a uh, speech that was reported clear back in 91. Uh, as a matter of fact, the year before the Year Summit um, at the uh, Bilderberger Conference. Uh, I don't remember what country that was in. Um, the environment is uh, the next item on the three E's. Uh, the environment will be used as a tool to promote political ideas and agendas that would otherwise be so wildly unpopular 
that they would have no chance of being implemented. Through various smart growth, zoning regulations, wilderness bills, wildlands and endangered species initiatives, private property can become increasingly controlled and eventually eliminated. Uh, unelected stakeholder councils are organized to give local governments a consensus or a vision statement for their communities. These groups, in effect, are transferring individual property rights to a collective system where all property is tightly controlled by a central planning authority, a regional, national, or internationally sanctioned tax-exempt NGO is usually behind these efforts and acts as a facilitator to steer the stakeholders to a predetermined conclusion. Land use laws become progressively more restrictive, expensive to implement, and difficult to litigate until property owners eventually give up or sell off their property rights. And if uh, I would suggest that you Google search the Delphi technique. That is a, a technique that's been used in our universities and our school system to achieve consensus where it would otherwise be very difficult. And incidentally, the Delphi technique was actually originally developed by Dr. Pavlov uh, in the Soviet Union in the 1930s uh, to help Stalin with his education programs. And are you aware that NGOs as such didn't exist in the U.S. prior to the 1950s? Uh, they're an invention of the United Nations technocrats to promote radical social and political change within society while appearing to be motivated, motivated by grassroots local or regional movements. Uh, these uh, NGOs as such did not even exist here until the UN created them. Uh, there are hundreds of radical social and environmental movements that were originally sponsored and sanctioned by the UN. Uh, and have become mainstays in U.S. environmental, wildlife, educational, social, and political movements. And this is a great little... Uh, um, Paul, the Montana Policy Institute, my friend uh, Carl Graham, uh, did a study, and he uh, tr uh, tried to connect all the various uh, uh, NGOs and uh, different foundations together. And uh, please Google this up. MontanaLegacyTakers.org. Um, there is a site there, and you can connect all these uh, various uh, 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 environmental and different foundations and where the money trail comes from. Uh, this is a really interesting uh, program, so please go take a look at that. Um, and this is a uh, quote by Carl Blois uh, of the uh, communist publication, The Daily World. Um, the environmental movement promises to bring greater numbers into our orbit than the peace movement ever did. And this is a quote by uh, uh, Dr. Otmar Edenhofer, who happened to be the lead author of the uh, IPCC uh, program uh, that uh, uh, basically defined anthropogenic global warming, man clause global warming. And uh, this is a quote from him. We redistribute de facto the world's wealth by climate policy. One has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy is environmental policy. This has almost nothing to do with environmental policy anymore. This is a quote in 2010. And this is uh, uh, Christiana Figueres. And uh, she's the executive director of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, in Doha, Qatar, in 2012. It must be understood that what is occurring here, not just in Doha, but in the whole climate change process, is a complete transformation of the economic structure of the world. A centralized transformation that is going to make the life of everyone on the planet very different. So this is a uh, picture of Beijing in 2008, just before the Olympics. And uh, uh, this shows the level of smog there. They had to shut the entire uh, city down for about a month so that they could even hold the Olympics. But uh, in reality, the environment's just used as a tool 
to transfer wealth from rich to poor countries uh, who are 10 to 20 times more likely to pollute the environment because of their lax environmental laws. And I would suggest um, a transfer from uh, capitalist countries to communist and socialist countries. Because if you see where the money's going, it's going to Brazil, it's going to India, it's going to China, it's going to Indonesia, it's going to countries that are either very heavily socialist or outright communist countries. This is a, a list of Agenda 21 uh, Sustainable Development Warm and Fuzzy Expressions. Now I put this list up here, it's going to be hard for people to read because it's fairly small, but uh, uh, words that we would hear once in a great while uh, 20 years ago, now we hear on on a daily basis, it's part of our common vernacular, uh, stakeholders, uh, invasive species, uh, 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 quality of life, uh, benefit of all, social justice uh, facilitators, uh, traffic calming, sustainable medicine. I mean, the list goes on and on, but a lot of these, uh, these things didn't, uh, weren't part of our common language until uh, after the uh, Earth Summit, and, and they're being adopted on a regular basis. And you may recognize some of the programs that are either closely associated with or facilitating, and I'll use one of their own words, uh, Agenda 21 policies. Uh, the Wildlands Project, the Clean Water Act, which is currently being expanded to all water in the United States. Um, and it will be all water of the world, incidentally. Uh, the Clean Air Act, uh, numerous wilderness bills, uh, Antiquities and National Monuments Acts, uh, National Grasslands Act, that's the uh, free roaming bison. We had a great discussion about that over at the MACO conference today. Uh, Endangered Species Act, uh, large predator reintroduction, interconnecting wildlife corridors, uh, the Yukon uh, to uh, Yucatan, uh, which they let her change to the uh, Yellowstone to Yukon because of the public outcry, but it really is Yucatan uh, to Yukon. Uh, North American Biodiversity Treaty, conservation easements nationwide, and finally the uh, Law of the Sea Treaty, which is uh, an international treaty that will regulate every drop of water on the planet. And this is the uh, Wildlands Project, uh, Yukon to Yucatan, and uh, this is uh, this is not my map. These maps are readily available. This map is uh, right on the Wildlands uh, Project site, uh, and it shows all these interconnecting uh, uh, wilderness areas that will go all the way from Mexico to uh, uh, Alaska, and uh, they haven't some of these areas here. They haven't quite filled in yet. They're in the early uh, planning stage of the project. These are further advanced. And incidentally, this is the National Grasslands, uh, and we will take a look at that. That, uh, oh, actually, let me go back. Um, that group is out of Bozeman, Montana, that's promoting that. Uh, they're, uh, they're here in our midst uh, promoting a lot of these efforts. This is the uh, Wildlands Conservation Planning in White Hawaii, and this is just another one of the maps, and these are available. Um, you'll see the, uh, the same areas, maybe a little different color, but the same thing. And this is a map of uh, wilderness conservation forest priorities. I'm on the, uh, uh, I am on the uh, 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 Montana Stewardship Foundation as a uh, trustee. And we look at areas uh, in Montana that are uh, being proposed as wilderness areas or conservation areas. And you'll see the dark areas right here. Uh, those are the high priorities. And incidentally, you'll see where the funding for these high priorities. Uh, these are the competitive grants that are going into promoting many of these uh, wilderness and conservation areas. Um, and these, this is a fairly old one, but uh, uh, the funding is always targeted in the areas. It, it's all, always coincidental, but they're always uh, targeted in areas that are part of these big maps that we've been looking at for anywhere from uh, 5 to 25 years. 
This is a long-term process, and it's, uh, it's being treated uh, very carefully as a long-term process. Uh, this is a map of uh, proposed new wilderness in a bill uh, uh, sponsored by uh, Carolyn Mahoney, who, uh, this was in 2010. Uh, she is a uh, representative from uh, uh, Manhattan Island in New York City. Uh, she had a proposal for over 23 million acres in Idaho, Washington, Montana, uh, Wyoming. And uh, it's in, in, interesting to me that these people from places like New York City are driving so many of these wilderness spills. This is a... Uh, um, map out of, uh, this came from Range Magazine, but this is a map that came uh, uh, out of the uh, World Wildlife Fund, uh, currently listed as a priority area of concern by the Department of the Interior. This is the National Grasslands Initiative. We talked about that today at MACO. Uh, free roaming bison and the end to much productive agriculture and resource development. Uh, there's a reason that uh, we're being so restrictive on utilizing uh, the oil and gas reserves that we have in eastern Montana. And this is the, uh, the new uh, spotted owl. Uh, this is the greater sage grouse. And this is a uh, BLM planning map that uh, they put together. Uh, and this shows the areas of high concern over sage grouse. This is a You'll see Montana up here. This is Wyoming, Colorado, Nevada, Idaho, uh, Utah, and, uh, and Oregon. And uh, if this uh, uh, becomes an endangered species and gets listed, it will literally uh, uh, shut down most uh, grazing on public lands throughout the western United States and uh, probably have uh, almost total... Uh, negative impact on the uh, cattle industry. And uh, they talk about habitat is the main cause for a reduction in habitat, is the main cause for the reduction in sage grouse. Uh, well, they've done camera studies, and this uh, little bugger right here, ravens, are the number one uh, cause of uh, predation against sage grouse. They're nest robbers, as well as magpies, and crows, and a lot of these smaller um, uh, predators, we'll call them predators, badgers, coyotes, stuff like that, um, they'll actually uh, eat the, the chicks or take, uh, rob the eggs out of the nest and eat the eggs. And uh, man and man's activity is way down on the list. According to the camera studies, it's about number 14. And this is a, a map from the Bureau of Land Management, it's only a year old. Uh, average number of leases the BLM has issued during each administration. And we start out here with the Reagan administration at 8,800. And you can see the line. And I think you can see a pretty clear trend where uh, leases on public land are going. I mean, that's almost a straight line down. So um, it, it won't be long and you won't see any public lands. Land swaps and uh, acquisitions are being proposed all over in Montana to consolidate FWP, NRCS, and federal land holdings. Uh, this is the Rob Ledford um, Wildlife Management Area in Madison and Beaverhead County. And the FWP and a, a number of uh, uh, different government agencies came to uh, uh, southwest Montana and talked to the county commissioners in these counties. And what they wanted to do was try to consolidate under one ownership all of these areas. There were six of them that were being proposed and they thought they could swap land back and forth between the various agencies so that each agency uh, uh, could control or mostly control one area. And uh, this, uh, this map right here shows how they, uh, the different ownerships are. And if they could consolidate those, they would make them really easy for the government to turn into um, the um, uh, wilderness areas and the conservation areas. And this is the uh, Blackfoot Challenge. Uh, this is an area that you may be familiar with. It's up around the Avon area. Uh, this is the Nature Conservancy. They go in and act as a facilitator 
and they buy up uh, conservation easements and land and then uh, turn around and sell it to the federal government or the state of Montana. And that means that the federal government doesn't go through the uh, necessary uh, scrutiny that would be part of taking all this private land and turning it into public land. Anyway, this is the uh, Blackfoot Challenge. And what we've, uh, what we've been working with is uh, these groups, uh, Nature Conservancy in this area, it comes in, uh, buys a bunch of conservation easements, buys a bunch of land, and then they turn around and they sell it to the state or federal government. And they get a premium for doing that. Now, they'll get tax credits and all other kinds of things. But the collaboration is that uh, the federal government or the state uh, FWP or other agencies can go in and get land, quite large tracts of land, without having to uh, account for that to the, uh, to the taxpayers. And they don't have to go through the same processes and the same reviews that, uh, that they would have to do if they were buying that land from individuals. And this, look, that little spot right there is this thing right here. And this is uh, part of the crown of the continent. You guys are very familiar with that. Uh, here's uh, Flathead Lake right here and the crown of the continent, uh, and believe me, they are dead serious about getting all that land uh, in the crown of the continent. Um, it's uh, promoted by, well, Bacchus while he was there, now Tester's working on it, and the Nature Conservancy, and the Montana uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks uh, is also a uh, partner in that process. So uh, most of these are... Uh, are working together to try to create this very, very large, very significant uh, piece of land that uh, fits right uh, within that map that I showed you of uh, the wilderness areas in the western states. Uh, most of these programs involve restrictions on use of private property near public lands and the gradual implementation of absolute government control of property remaining in private hands. They have to control uh, and regulate uh, the, the areas around this public land and in doing that they can add to the public land. Uh, every time these initiatives are expanded the property tax base shrinks as a result of private land being taken off the tax rolls and as a consequence the cost and the restrictions to remaining property owners goes up and the productive use of their land goes down. This is how to boil a frog. Very, very slowly. You throw him in a pot of hot water, he'll jump right out. But if you put him in that pot and it's lukewarm and you turn it up a degree at a time, you'll cook him surely. And that's what's happening uh, in our country. We're being the uh, boiled frogs right now. It's called gradualism. Uh, this is a report by the National Intelligence Council. This was a report, and it was online. I think you can probably still find uh, another iteration of this. This is several years old, but this was uh, made for the president, uh, and it uh, basically the executive summary says, uh, if we don't hurry, we're not going to get global governance uh, by 2025. Uh, we really need to get moving on these programs. Uh, it's all about government control. It's all about international global government. And uh, you'll see the sponsors of this. It's the UN, uh, the International Monetary Fund, the G20, uh, all these groups that uh, we see uh, in all of our news programs. Uh, they're part of this whole process. Uh, a gentleman by the name of J. Gary Lawrence, he's the uh, chief planner for the city of Seattle. Uh, which has some of the most restrictive zoning laws and some of the most costly housing in the country. Uh, under Agenda 21, most Americans will be forced to live in high-rise apartment buildings on public transportation routes, and single-family residences will only be for the super wealthy and the ruling elite. Now, this is a uh, program or a book that, uh, not a book, but an article that he wrote for uh, the UK, the UNED, uh, uh, UN uh, Education Development Council for the UK. Uh, future of Local Agenda 21 in the New Millennium. 
Uh, it went to the UK because if you'd written it in the United States and somebody got wind of it, uh, there'd be a lot of, a lot of problems. Um, and this is a quote by Jer Gary Lawrence uh, in an article, The Future of Agenda 21 in the New Millennium. This is what was in that booklet. Uh, participating in a UN advocated planning process would very likely bring out many who would actively work to defeat any elected official uh, undertaking local Agenda 21. So, we will call our process something else, such as comprehensive planning, growth management, or smart growth. How many times do we hear about smart growth in our zoning ordinances and in our, in our planning? Uh, I mean, it's part of our culture now. ICLE, and ICLE is the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives. Uh, it's become the major driving force for smart growth policies throughout the United States. Uh, ICLE programs have been implemented in 550 American cities, including Bozeman, Helena, and Missoula. And ICLE uses the slogan, Global to Local Action Plans, and incorporates highly collectivist central planning concepts that were developed in the Soviet Union during the 1950s. Uh, stack and pack housing projects located next to major transportation hubs that eliminate the use of private transportation. In essence, cities become islands of uh, intense human activity in a sea of pristine natural wilderness areas that are off limits for average citizens. Uh, Dr. Michael Kaufman refers to these as human kennels. It's a pretty appropriate term. Uh, this is a future envision for most Americans under Agenda 21. I mean, they're, they're not saying they're going to be absolutely nasty and mean to us. They're going to build these beautiful buildings, and they're going to be, it's called uh, TOD, uh, Transportation Oriented Development, and uh, it will be living under techno-feudalism. You'll live in a building next to a major transportation line. You get these rail lines. Um, and these high-rise buildings, the uh, space will be uh, whatever they decide to give you. But right now in New York City, uh, they're working on apartment buildings in New York City uh, where uh, an apartment is 374 square feet. And... Uh, and they're very compact. And uh, I think ultimately uh, that might seem spacious compared to what we might end up with. <clears throat> so what is uh, feudalism? I call it techno-feudalism. It's a return to servitude. Uh, feudalism uh, uh, via Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary is a European political and economic system from the 9th to the, about the 15th century based on a relation of lord to vassal held on condition of homage and service. That's what we're uh, facing in our future. We will be vassals. And this is a uh, ghost city, a new city that was designed uh, by a Chicago architectural firm for the uh, communist Chinese government. Uh, it will support, um, in the article that uh, this was in, this was in Design Build magazine, said 80,000. I believe it will be, by the look of the structures, it'll be 800,000 uh, Chinese with no automobiles allowed. These, uh, this whole concept is uh, totally uh, pedestrian, and this uh, park area that's just outside of it will be uh, uh, the public land. And this is a uh, uh, new commissioner training handout that uh, we had some years ago. I, we all laugh about it. Uh, we've got a few commissioners here that remember this. Um, it was uh, most of the articles in this publication were uh, on sustainable planning and development and were written by authors representing the three Montana Ickley cities. Yeah, Helena, uh, Missoula, and Bozeman. And uh, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. I'd say this is worth about a million. Uh, these three young people, they look kind of uh, threadbare, uh, not very well dressed on these old bicycles, don't look like very expensive ones. And they're on this uh, uh, concrete uh, path that looks like it used to be an old roadway. And they're looking for the future and they, don't, they can't see the end of it. I think that's pretty appropriate. 
We need to understand that these sustainable development policies permeate every county in America and are being openly promoted by both political parties, both major political parties. This is not a Democrat-Republican thing. This is world socialism, world Marxism, uh, world government, the new world order versus those who believe in a constitutional Republican form of government. That's the difference. It's time that we stand as Americans and protect the liberties and freedoms guaranteed under our Constitution and the Bill of Rights. We need to hold freedom more precious than comfort. We need to make thinking, reading, and participation in learning more important than leisure and being entertained. We need to get off the couch and get away from our beer pretzels and uh, football games and start reading and learning and understanding what we're facing and start participating. We need to become enlightened, motivated protectors of our legacy and defend leaders that understand and are willing to risk everything to serve our republic. We need leaders and we need good leaders. So what can you do to help? Well, you need to elect better public officials that understand their duty to serve and to protect the citizens they represent. Under the Constitution, local government should be the most representative of individual citizens. Our system of government was designed to be from the bottom up, not the top down. And it was designed that way so that local leaders who talk on a daily basis with the citizens they represent uh, will be the strongest political influence in this country. We've got it completely backwards. We've got the, the uh, uh, almost uh, dictatorial powers of the president and the rest of us are just being blown along like leaves in the wind. That's wrong. We should not have to live that way and we shouldn't allow it. Get involved. The reason that we've lost so many of our rights is that because we've sat on our backsides and allowed everybody else to do the heavy lifting. Uh, he who shows up wins. We need to start showing up. Um, we need to apply to boards and councils and these things. Yes, we're busy people. Yes, we don't want to control anybody else's life. But guess what? The people that volunteer for these boards are the people that want to control other people. And they, want, they have lots of time and they have uh, uh, lots of energy because they're living on the system that we're supporting. We need to start being uh, the people that show up for these boards. Uh, we need to read, learn, educate yourself, and become teachers of others. Knowledge is power, and ignorance is not bliss. It's just ignorance. And if it's allowed to go on long enough, it becomes stupidity. Hold politicians and bureaucrats accountable and for all of their actions. And if you see something that you don't like, tell them about it and demand that they correct it. Don't expect something for nothing. There's no free money, and what we ask for today with borrowed money will enslave our children tomorrow. We need to care about their future. These, these so-called free grants and all this free money, there's no such thing as free money. Uh, please go look uh, on, the, on the Internet and pull up the U.S. debt clock and watch that thing roll. Uh, right now we're at 18 trillion. In, uh, in current debt and 120, almost 123 trillion in unfunded liabilities that are, uh, it's eating us alive. Our debt is eating us alive. It's time to realize that and quit spending money we don't have. If we can't afford it and can't afford it on our own merit, then we shouldn't have it and we should say no. And this is a uh, quote by Samuel Adams. It's uh, excellent. If you love wealth better than liberty, the tranquility of servitude, better than the animating contest of freedom, go home from us in peace. We ask not your counsel or your arms. Crouch down and lick the hands which feed you. May your chains set lightly upon you and may posterity remember or forget that you were ever our countrymen. And uh, this is a statue outside of the UN. Uh, that is, uh, uh, really, that should give you a pretty good, pretty good idea where these uh, relentless attacks on our Second Amendment rights are coming from. Uh, they're not just uh, hapless American politicians, they're international politicians. 
Uh, China right now has a major advertising campaign in New York City uh, promoting gun control. Uh, of course. Why would uh, China or any other country that would like to see our demise want us to be armed? And this is a great quote by Ronald Reagan. Uh, you and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We will preserve for our children this the last best hope of man on earth of man on earth, or we will sentence them to take the first step into a thousand years of darkness. If we fail, at least let our children and our children's children say of us that we justified our brief moment here. We did all that could be done. That's what we need to do. Uh, there are none so blind as those who will not see. There are none so deaf as those who refuse to hear. That's a uh, uh, quote uh, from Polite Conversation, Jonathan Swift, and that's 1738. And uh, thank you for uh, attending this presentation. God bless America. And I am going to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, water compact too. So um, I'm, I'll go to the last slide that I've got here. Uh, Looks like we've had a little bit too much to think. That's the thought police. Um, anyway, uh, the uh, Salish Kootenai, we've, uh, we've been talking about that today at MAKO. And uh, it's very interesting. Uh, Clarice, uh, uh, where's Clarice at here? Oh, yeah. Um, Clarice has been uh, really a, a, a absolute stalwart. Um, she's been an absolute stalwart in the uh, process of... Uh, um, uh, the Salish Kootenai Compact, and she's brought uh, uh, speakers here to talk about it. Uh, we've got a real issue, I don't think most people realize, but uh, two years ago this summer, uh, President Obama signed the uh, UN Indigenous Peoples Treaty and uh, on behalf of the United States. Now, it hasn't been ratified, it hasn't been approved by the Senate, but that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of difference. Uh, neither was the uh, uh, sustainability uh, treaty. It wasn't ratified either, and yet we've got all their programs in place. Um, under the uh, Indigenous People Treaty, uh, much of the lands of uh, many countries uh, will be turned back to the uh, native uh, cultures that, uh, that that land was taken from. Um, be in Australia, it'd be Aborigines in different areas, uh, South America, it may be the, uh, uh, the Indian populations down there, in North America, uh, North American uh, Indians. Um, the problem with that is we've got uh, many, many millions of people that have been living here for a very long time and their families, and uh, that makes no sense at all to try to take all that land back but yet uh, it is uh, being proposed as such. So uh, under that, the uh, Salish Kootenai um, compact, water compact, uh, much of uh, the uh, uh, water that is part of the area for irrigators and for uh, uh, agriculture in this area will be subject to the regulations of the, uh, the Indian populations. And... Uh, I, we have to understand, the government will give the Native Americans or the uh, indigenous people back their land, and then they'll take it back again. I mean, these people have been screwed once already, in fact, more than once. And uh, I can tell you, the international uh, monetary uh, financial oligarchs could care less about fairness with uh, Native Americans or any other indigenous people. They'll take that land, uh, give it back, and then they'll take it back. And, uh, and that's the way that the whole process is designed to work. And they're using water in Montana is a very, very key element of that. And in the United States, once they control the water, agriculture uh, in much of uh, the United States won't be productive anymore. And they'll be able to control the land. If you cannot raise a crop on your land without irrigation and they take away the irrigation, you don't have anything. You're better off just to leave it and move to the city uh, and, and live in J. Gary Lawrence's world in a high-rise apartment building. Uh, water is a real serious issue, um, and they will use that water 
as a way to uh, control our population. So we need to be very careful about that. Uh, Clarice, you uh, do a bang up job. Please uh, continue to uh, fight that battle. There's nobody that uh, has worked any harder than you have in that. Yes. Follow that thought. There's no water and there's no protection. There's no food. You want to reduce the population of the world. We're already doing it in Africa throughout many parts of the, of the world. The, all of the uh, uh, Middle East is kill it, they're killing themselves. Mm -hmm. And you starve us out. So no water, no food, and you have no choice if you want to live but to go where they can hurt you, and that's where we're headed. Yeah, that's right. Now, this is. Uh, uh, Commissioner Susie Foss from Ravalli County, um, and uh, Susie just uh, made a very poignant uh, point of saying that without water, uh, you can't raise food. Without food, you can't live on the land, uh, and that's a great way to reduce population, and it's a great way to control what remaining population you have by moving in, them into areas where they can keep an eye on you. I would, I would like to say that there was a name, Wilma. Uh, was here for two weeks uh, down on the reservation and uh, the first week and also here and she is uh, herself a Cherokee and her, she's married to uh, the descendant of Secretary Leah and uh, she uh, will be leading the way in that fight. Uh, she wrote a book. It was uh, very, uh, very outstanding. It's uh, going to pieces, the dismantling of the United States of America. She was very perceptive. She has uh, written uh, a very short uh, eight-point uh, eight uh, argument against this uh, compact. And I have some copies here, and I would like to get the information out to all of you. Uh, I'll stand at the door if you'd like to uh, sign up for it before you leave. Uh, she is paving the way for us to fight it here. 350,000 people in 11 counties is what this is going to involve if this tribe gets that water. Good. Thank you, Thank you, I, I, I'll have a video of a lame, uh, lame woman on my site this week, too. I have one that I'm waiting to put up there. You can see when she was at sites last, last week. I, you know, I think that's really excellent. People, you hear various points of view on, on the water compact and on the issues of water, but keep one thing in mind, uh, and I hate to sound this uh, uh, pessimistic about it. If they control the water, they control you. I mean, water and air are two things we cannot live without. And um, if, if they can control the source of our water, they can control what we do on that land. And uh, believe me, this is not a, uh, uh, a light thing to be taken lightly. Uh, these people ser are serious about controlling every aspect of our use of water. Uh, they are talking about putting meters on domestic wells. Um, I've got a well at my house that uh, I don't even want to tell you the tragic story of drilling wells at my place, but um, I drilled five uh, dry holes before I hit water on the uh, sixth hole. And uh, I spent uh, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $80,000 drilling wells. And um, I paid for my water. I'll be damned if I want them sticking a, a meter on my water that I, I drilled uh, and paid for. And that's what they plan to do. They plan to control your use of your own well on your own land. And I'm talking things like uh, yards, like uh, a lawns. You know, they'll just tell you, you can't grow a lawn. Uh, yeah, they're doing it right now. Well, they're doing it in Colorado, parts of Colorado, too. And the and, uh, thing is, they put a restriction on, on water. And I guess, you know, there's a certain, you, you can understand a little bit of that. But now they're talking, doing that in areas like this, like here in, uh, in Montana, where we've got plenty of water. And the interesting thing is that it's not the Indians themselves who are the federal government. Right. It's the owns the Indians and owns the land and the federal government is using them. Absolutely. And I mean, we have to understand one thing. Uh, Native Americans have, have been. Uh, taken advantage of for uh, 150 years. Now, I really believe that. Uh, they were a Stone Age culture. Uh, we came in and, uh, and yes, the government, uh, and there were a lot of policies. I think they could have gone along just fine 
uh, with most of the uh, population, but uh, government policies uh, put them on the reservations and did a lot of the uh, things that have happened. It was not fair, but uh, doing some of the things they're talking about doesn't correct that. What it does is it takes land away from people that have worked hard and earned that land and paid for that land and then give it back and then take it because I guarantee you it won't stay in uh, the hands of Native Americans very long and they'll take it again. They did it once, why wouldn't they do it again? It is basically the loss of private property. Yeah, absolutely, it's a loss of private property. Ron, Ron Stoltz, uh, he's also a commissioner from Her Valley. Yeah, um, the other thing they're doing down in our area is they're um, buying land and then they're having it put into the Bureau of Interior to take it out of our tax base. Our county already has 73% public government controlled land. So how much percentage will they have to take up before they collapse the mm -hmm. county and the people? Yes. Just like you were saying, how making the taxes higher, you know, put more in the government that isn't. Well, the other thing is what they're buying is on water. They're buying riverfront property, and we have no ability once it goes into the trust with the feds, and they hold it in trust with the tribe, and so we no longer have any authority so that um, if they want to do anything on that property that might uh, hurt our water or you know, clean water, clean air, anything, we have no control over it, no say. So it's, it's, a, it's just, it's probably happening here and you just don't even know about it. And they lie, I'm sorry, but they lied to you because we were closing on one and we were having a meeting about it and we asked them very clearly, do you have any other properties that you're going to be buying in the near future? And they said, absolutely not. We have no money. And two days later, the clerk and recorder of our county came up and said, we just closed on and I just filed on another piece of property. So well, you know, the thing is, they're buying, Susie. Yeah, well, they are. And, and the thing that they're doing is that they're... Uh, they're uh, taking our property rights uh, and, they're, and they're taking all this land and every time they do that, they take away, they reduce our tax base. Uh, they reduce our ability to be able to productively use any of the land that we've got. And uh, as they take that away and, and add it to the list of uh, federal properties, we now have all this property, this federal land, and we've got an $18 trillion deficit and guess who's buying our debt? The Chinese, the Federal Reserve. And uh, that, that means that they're going to have access to that land. And, we, you know, the public land debate has been uh, discussed how, well, state can't take this land. All they want to do is, is uh, uh, sell it to private individuals. That's absolute nonsense. Uh, what the feds are concerned about and what the state, well, what the state should be concerned about is that we've got this mountain of debt and we've got all this uh, public land and uh, the people that we owe that debt to are our, our uh, political enemies. So, I mean, that's just crazy. What are we doing to ourselves? Yes, ma'am. Um, what the federal government is really concerned about, what the UN is really concerned about, is for one thing in Montana, the people are understanding that uh, generally understood, every home has at least 27 guns in their home. But if the people of the Montana can grasp the concept that the federal government is really afraid of us realizing they can, we have unalienable rights to our property, to our water, to our wells. They have no jurisdiction over our properties unless we give it to them. Right. Right. And what they're afraid of is the people to join together and stand their ground against the federal government and say, no, as long as they can pick us off one at a time, mm -hmm. they have us. But when we unite together to say, that's enough, no more. We go back to the Constitution and the, Dec the Declaration of Independence and the, the laws that govern people are self-governing of common law and actually God's law too, that the federal government would have no control over us. It's the people who are supposed to govern the government, not the government controlling the people. Well, and that, that is uh, kind of the point that I tried to make early. Um, we need to elect better local leaders. Now, I don't think there's any question in anybody's mind 
that our federal government is out of control. And, and uh, obviously, if the federal government's out of control, the international government would be an absolute nightmare. But we have to have stronger local leaders that are willing to assert the rights of the people and, and stand up for the rights of the people. Now, I'm, I'm gonna, I don't want to embarrass anybody here, but I have to tell you, uh, Susie Foss and, and Ron Stoltz were both county commissioners in, in Ravalli County. They had a concerted effort to get them unelected. These are true patriots. These are two people here that, uh, that have always uh, stood up for private property and the individuals. And they were targeted for elimination. I'm up for election myself. And um, I, I know there are people headhunting me too. Um, the problem is, is the good elected leaders, we've got so many bad elected leaders that go after the good ones. And the average American doesn't have enough sense to do a little research and find out who the good ones and the bad ones are. And I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. I mean, they, they uh, read, read the local newspaper, which are, there's five corporations that control the media in the United States. And I'm talking the television, newspapers, uh, radio, everything. There's five major corporations that control it all. Now, how are we gonna get actual uh, verifiable facts uh, on a controlled press like that? We're not. And, and uh, the, the uh, Germans learned that uh, back in the 1930s. And we're, we're living in a, in a world where we're fed what they want us to know. So. Just, I'm just gonna say real quick, one of the last thoughts in your presentation says, make sure that your elected officials are accountable and you challenge them. The problem is, when the people who elect you and you do exactly what you said you'll do, you stay true to your convictions and not bow to the mob rule, and, the, and you become the enemy of this movement, I've had five years of character assassination that has been non-stop. And it's not one thing that's been said about me is true. But I, I won by 5,000 votes. I did exactly what I said I would do, and I lost by 5,000 votes. That they had, we have these open primaries. If you don't support closing primaries, forget ever getting a Dan or a Susie or a Ron or a Derek elected because the Democrats crossed in the open primary and voted for, right. the, for the weak Republican candidates. And it came from letters that came out from the unions and from the party, and they did it, and it's been nationwide. We've lost great people, but the thing I want to say, like Dan is, Dan is up for election. He knows he's a target. And if people don't stand up, I had four people call me in four years and ask me to clarify something they read about me in the paper. Four out of 40,000 citizens who care enough to ask me directly, I just read this about you, is that true? Did you vote that way or do you think that way? Or did you comb your hair that way? And then they go after your family. And that's just happened to me. They're just, they're trying to drive us out of our county. My husband's been there, his family, a hundred years. So you guys, it's great to say vote, elect good people, but by God, if you're not gonna stand behind them, then you deserve what you get. Because we have thrown away good leadership and we get petty, we won't elect, and I'm not saying right or wrong, but I sure as hell would have rather have had a Sarah Palin or a Mitt Romney than what we got right now. But someone didn't want to put a Mormon in, or someone didn't want to put in. You know, we got to think, and you got to get out and talk to people. This is, this is our life. Our children are, are already lost. So many of them have gone to a liberal school, but our grandchildren and our great grandchildren will never know what we have right here. They'll never be allowed to assemble and speak their minds and challenge. It will be gone, and it will be our fault. Please, please. Get outside of your chairs and outside of these rooms and get out there and work to save this country. Well, that's right, Susan. Well, that's gentlemen back here. Backing up a half a page to the meters on your water and other parts of the country, 
They're already implementing smart meters for electricity, yep. which folds in with part of Agenda 21. Absolutely. Um, to touch on what Susan just said about um, us as a people and gathering, as I look at the crowd tonight, I would have thought that a building this size would have been crowded. The demographic to me, um, no insult to anybody that's older than me, but most of the people here are of retirement age and there's only a couple people that I see here that are even younger than myself. And I think that's a pretty sad state, a pretty sad statement. And it's a condition, what we're dealing with in our country today is not a lack of knowledge, it's certainly with the internet. I'll maintain that it's a lack of care. It's a heart condition that we suffer from. A, yeah, we've definitely been dumbed down. We've been brainwashed. We've had mind control techniques for decades. We've had our education system hijacked and we've had our police um, militarized and all these other things. Our food's been tainted, our air and our waters have been poisoned. But our hearts have been conditioned to a point to where we simply do not care any longer because, well, there's a million reasons, but we have a heart condition, not all these other things. That's that's what I'll maintain. And until the hearts of men are changed, they are. then you'll see a change. Until they are changed, you won't see a change. You'll see the continued de declination of morality and and uh, social justice, and what do we have going on in Flathead County with with uh, our, our so-called legal system right now? The state attorney general won't even take a look at the criminal activity at our prosecutor attorney's office. Mm -hmm. in Flat the, the state attorney general says there's nothing going on there. And it's criminal activity. If you or I are going to drive you down the road and drive 10 miles an hour, you're going to get a speeding ticket. They're going to crucify you for stepping outside the lines. Well, what, you know, your comment about the uh, spirituality, I think you noticed that uh, early in the program, uh, Stalin said there were uh, three things that separated uh, uh, Americans, and once they destroyed those three things, that uh, we would fall. And uh, I think the number one is spirituality. Uh, we've lost our, uh, our connection to, to, uh, to our Lord. We really have. And uh, this gentleman here, but I, I wanted to catch you too. Let me. Well, I've got a whole lot of things that were said. But one of the, one of the things I wanted to say was concern. Was my turn? Uh, your turn, because you had your hand up first, but I want to get this gentleman too. Well, 19, I, I mentioned this before, but I'm telling you, Grant's the second 1920. Talk louder. Can I hear you, Brad? I said in 19, I said Tony on the ramp sheet, but 19, 1921, that the way the story of Mark is to take over the courts and move the father from the home. 1964, the 1960, the Illuminati was a little mad, and we weren't going fast enough. Then they started to attack the family, remove the, take over the courts, remove the father from the home. And we've been going down ever since then. We have a divorce rate over 66%. Most men in this country could care less anymore. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. But it, it it's was a uh, it's spirituality, and it, and it, and it really uh, grounds you. See, the communists don't believe in, uh, and certainly not in, in uh, Jesus Christ, but they don't believe in They don't believe in faith. Family. They don't believe in family. That's right. They want to control everything. And, uh, one more thing real fast. Environmental. I went to my first meeting on environmentalism with Conrad Burns back around 1991. Back when he was a senator anyway. Mm -hmm. And there was this young man there as an environmentalist and he says, he starts talking about logging is bad, mining is bad, this is bad, this is bad. So I started saying to him, how did you get here? Did you drive a car? Yeah. Give up your car. Do you live in a house? Yeah. Give up your house. Do you eat food? Yes. Stop eating food. Stop drinking water. Stop breathing air. If that time you'll be dead, then I'll listen to you. <laughs> but I can't get nobody to say that. It's simple. Yeah. No, it's true. It's true. And and that is the uh, the fallacy of that whole that whole environmental movement. Now I have some very good friends who are environmentalists. I really do. And uh, some of them are pretty darn good people. I mean, they're well-meaning, and they really honestly want to do the right thing for the environment. But so do we. I mean, we're stewards of the land. I, you know, most of the farmers and ranchers I know are uh, excellent land stewards. 
And uh, in the United States, people have to remember one thing. There would be no environmental movement as it's organized today unless we had the wealth to create uh, the environmental cleanup that we're doing. The reason that we have the kind of country we do and we can talk about environmentalism is because we've created enough wealth that we can actually do it. You go to the poor countries of the world and their environment is awful. And it's because they're spending their money trying to survive. They don't have money uh, to uh, put in EPA regulations. So uh, let me add this gentleman right here. Uh, uh, just very quickly, um, there was a, uh, one of your screens said, what can we do? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in my experience in city government and watching county government and state government as well, is you have to take it down to the lowest common denominator, which really is right here. In God we trust. Jesus Christ, we are saved. I mean, it starts here, basically. It starts right here. But the other thing is, is that uh, uh, one, of the, one of the things that's happened in city government that we're all guilty of is we don't care. You know what we did? We hired a manager. We hired a guy to come into town with a bag and he, he wants to improve his resume so he can move down to Bozeman. And you know why they changed their policies down there? Because we trained him up here. Right? And the next group are the planners. And the county is just as guilty. You ought to fire all your planners and you ought to fire your, your managers. Put somebody in to balance the checkbook, but you make the decisions. And we insist that our council people make the decisions, not a planner that doesn't even know, uh, they've never seen our town before. They get off an airplane and they're experts. Oh, well, and they we are. write up a big page on them of what a great job they did and what a great job is to a planner is spending money and developing programs and following all the BS that you just promoted. Well, and the thing is, is that uh, they're their plan is to control development because that leads to more of what we're talking about. And if you, if you look at most uh, planning schemes in this country, and I'm talking uh, even in very rural counties, it's all about restricting development and restricting the right of individuals to own and, and productively use their land. I, uh, um, I think most people in even very rural counties recognize that uh, our state government, uh, MACO certainly, or at least at the, uh, at the uh, state level with MACO, uh, they concern themselves about land use law. And uh, we shouldn't be worrying about controlling other people's land. I mean, we didn't have most of these regulations in place, hardly any of them until the mid-1960s and somehow we just stumbled through and did okay. I mean, what we've got going on right now, it, it just keeps building on itself because we've got this phony mountain of money that's been printed and, and promoted by the Federal Reserve System and, and creating uh, unnatural wealth because it's not based on anything other than a printing press. And so they've got to get rid of the money. So you develop and you grow. And, and what's happened is we've had this enormous amount of, of economic activity in this country over the last 20 or 30 years. And it's all based on debt. Every bit of it's based on debt. And so the more we build, the more in debt we are. And the more reason they have to try to control us. I mean, it just, it, it's, uh, it's counterintuitive that we should be uh, taking all this money and doing the things that we're doing because we're basically just hanging ourselves with every bit of it. One final thought. When we passed uh, the budget for the city of Kalispell, there wasn't one person that stood up and said, I don't agree with any part of it. Mm -hmm. And we as a community should go to that city council and say, if you're accepting money and you think it's free, think again because we don't need it. If we can't do it ourselves and we can't pay for it, don't take it. Amen. I, I, uh, I go through that very argument literally every week. If we can't afford to pay for it ourselves, we don't need a grant because with every grant we get, there's either debt associated with it, uh, and I'm talking the national debt, if it comes from a federal grant, 
or there are strings attached. So if we can't afford to do it ourselves, we shouldn't do it. Just as simple as that. This gentleman here. Sorry, we don't have time for more questions. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're done. Get the lawyer from Georgia. <laughs> Let's lighten this up just a tad. If we carry the natives back to the prior inhabitants, we end up with Adam and Eve. So we're talking about a global concept here. <laughs> number two, I can see why you wanted to say that. <laughs> number two, it's just two more quick points. The federal government took the black people in the South and took them off of the plantations. Almost 200 years later, no, it wasn't that long, really, they turned around and put the Indians on government-run plantations. In both cases, it was this form of slavery. And the last point I want to make is this. When I came back to Montana in 92, I took my son down to the University of Montana to enroll him. He got enrolled and then they had a orientation meeting. President Denison's assistant came out and talked to the students for 45 minutes. It was all I could do to stay in my seat, not to embarrass my son. And for that 45 minutes, his representative talked about free market socialism. Wow. Now, if that That's isn't the there. worst oxymoron I've never heard, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what oxymoron means? Hot air by morons. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, it's pretty funny about that. You talk about that, but that's what they're saying is going on in China right now. Now, it's still a communist country. It's still under a communist uh, oligarchy, being controlled totally, the economy, and yet they talk about how free market principles. We have skewed our view of free markets so badly that we will actually accept that a communist system can have free markets. It's just not so. And, and what's happened is, that, again, going back to uh, uh, Gaither, um, the uh, 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 president of the Ford Foundation, their directive is to merge the United States and the communist Soviet Union into a one world system. And that's exactly what we've been doing for the last 40 years, 50 years. Yes, sir. I'll give, give it to him, big guy, and then I'll, I'll get you. So in China right now, you know, they're talking about the way they uh, greatly improved the safety of the workplace. Okay? You know how they did it? They put up suicide nets around the buildings. Apple Computer is guilty as hell of it. Uh, so the people couldn't kill themselves by jumping out the windows. That's the improvement of safety. Well, that's, apparently it works. That's what we got to look forward to. I know it. I know it. Just stupid, George. It, uh, the whole, the whole idea is just stupid because w w we've we've uh, turned into a system of international and it's fascism. It's fascism. What we're living under. It's national. It's not national socialism. It is uh, socialism where industry and government have been merged, and they call it public-private partnerships. Yeah. And uh, we're merging our government and 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 social uh, networking together, and our industries, and we've created a system that's straight out of uh, 1925 uh, fascist Italy. And, and, you know, fascism, they talk about fascism and communism. Uh, fascism and communism are twins. Sure. Uh, the only concept, uh, communism is international socialism, and fascism is national socialism. That's the only difference. And anybody that doesn't understand that doesn't understand what government is about. Yeah. I am pushing right now that all state senators will be appointed by the county. Just like, just like the 17th Amendment, our state federal senators were elected by the state. I like to see all 56 counties appoint one state senator. 56 state senators. 
and get it out of the hands of the people. This way, when they go back to Helena, it has checks and balances. Right now, everybody's elected by the people. All they care about is getting reelected. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good point, and I, you know, I, 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 I'll be real honest with you. I think that uh, what we need to do is just go back to what our Constitution said. Period, and and uh, and and uh, overturn or uh, uh, repeal the Seventeenth Amendment. Yeah, because that was the worst thing we but ever even did. On the state level, I think it would work. Well, yeah, it might, but that's something at the state level that they ought to address. So. <laughs> Oh, I am sorry. Yes, sir. I was just going to say that, uh, you know, looking at the bigger picture here and trusting our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, um, the very substance of our hope is actually doing something. We cannot fear government and fear God at the same time. So it is our duty in the trust of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to actually do something, which is what you're all saying. Mm -hmm. And the hope... Otherwise, we don't have any hope. We have no substance uh, to put our hope in. We have nothing that we have planted, and, we, and nothing is going to happen. Uh, in fact, as what Thomas Jefferson said, that if all of this needs to grow is for good people who sit and do nothing. So, um, and I would like to suggest, uh, I have uh, three children that recite the entire Declaration of Independence by heart. If you want to Google cool. it, if you want to, if you want to Google it, please do, and you'll you'll see uh, something being planted in the hearts of little children. Well, that's what we need to do. We really need to do that. We need to teach our children. Um, you know, it's kind of sad, but I, I volunteered about. Well, it's been about five years ago to teach a Constitution class at our uh, local high school, and the the guy that was the history teacher said, "No, we don't need that," and. Uh, I, I do a good job. I teach the Constitution. And then about five minutes later in the conversation, we have a program, you probably have it here, called Close Up, where the kids go to Washington, D.C. and uh, get a chance to watch uh, government, uh, kind of like making sausage. But uh, anyway, see, government in action, and that is a one, uh, a one word, in action. Um, but... <laughs> Anyway, uh, five, five minutes after this guy told me he didn't need me teaching a Constitution class, he was saying, well, this time we're going to go to the UN in New York City instead of Washington, D.C. Oh, that was four five years ago. If a five-year-old uh, or six-year-old can memorize the entire Declaration of Independence with understanding, mm -hmm. then this is a stoppable, this is a solvable problem. And, uh, but we need to be inspired. Mm -hmm. We need to remember why we're here and not be afraid of, like what this lady said, of, our, of the deformation of character that we are going to face. We have to press on because we have to answer for the grace that God has given us to be able to preserve his liberty. The, the whole reason for liberty is so that the gospel could be preached into all the world. Without liberty, the gospel cannot move freely. And people will never hear about freedom, never hear about liberty, and never have any hope. Christianity and, and our founding fathers and the whole concept of America are so immensely intertwined, so totally intertwined. And uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I have, uh, um, I have a commitment with my wife, and I, I just told her, I said, uh, you know, I don't think I'm going to die an old man in my bed uh, in my sleep. I think I'm going to probably get uh, whacked uh, because of the positions that I take. Um, I, you know, to be real honest with you, it doesn't scare me a bit because I'm committed to this and I'm committed to my Lord and I believe that uh, I am doing exactly the work that he wants me to do. And so, you know, I'm not afraid of, uh, of uh, politicians or, or uh, people trying to get rid of me. That's fine, you know. I'm just a tool.